What do you think about those? Um, did you listen to the innovators, the seven papers? Unfortunately, I've had I've been teaching and speaking at other events, so I haven't had the opportunity to listen to them. No, can you some tell very me a bit interesting more? ones? I think certainly in the field of uh, to me engineering, so to speak, uh, and and uh, AI. There's a Japanese investigator who showed that they created kind of like a robotic hand. Uh huh. Yes. Uh, that a motor sends um, signal, and then it's for people's choke who have trouble with the upper hand extremity mm -hmm. grabbing things, and it's got a glove, and it's got the um, well. There you go. Um, anyway, it's got sensor, and, and it was really good. I mean, I right. I thought you would be interested in hearing that. Yeah. Uh, another person looked at uh, microwave assisted endoscopy, looking at signals uh -huh. of polyps, which is great. Yeah. And then there's one on simulator for virtual reality doing use simulation. So I thought those would be, I mean, you know, they're really good social science, uh, medical science, but those are the engineering ones. Yes, right. Yeah. And uh, were they all in that uh, sort of uh, assistive technology or rehabilitation um, theme, or were there? No, some were diagnostics. Some were uh, re rehab, as you say, assistive technology. And I think one was really a, like a virtual reality. Yes, yeah. Mm. That's great. And With hi, Claude. <laughs> hi, Claude. Hello, folks. It's a pleasure to meet you all. Um, I thought I was going into uh, uh, the data and computer science uh, breakout session, but it's a pleasure to meet you all. I'm Claude Goodman, the CareWheels founder and president uh, with the CareBank project, and I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to share my work with my colleagues around the world through this Catalyst program. I think it's totally innovative. Um, so I don't know how I found myself in this room with you, but I feel honored to share this presence. <laughs> Thank you. So what, tell me more about your care. So what, what was the, the your initiative? Well, we've been developing a social care network using okay. technology to augment human relationships. And the way that we do that is um, we connect various devices like, uh, you can see here, a medication yeah. Uh, box with a little sensor okay uh -huh. and this sensor just detects that this box has been moved okay uh -huh. which in and of itself is not a big deal but when you share a little bit of data like this with a group of peers within your community then you have the opportunity to create a new kind of communication a new kind of intimacy whereby uh -huh. um, if somebody doesn't take their meds when they're supposed to, they get an alert on an app on their smartphone and they can then check to see, you know, why hasn't that person taken their medication today? So to compare it to the existing technology, which we're all probably familiar with, these uh, personal emergency response systems, the call for help buttons, uh, those buttons only work when a person pushes the button. And if they're incapacitated, they can't. And wearing those buttons is a stigma for many people. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. our system actually creates an alert when nothing happens, when a person isn't eating when they're supposed to, when they're not taking their medications on schedule. Oh, uh, that's interesting. Yeah, so um, how many IoT devices and on how many different functions do you... Um, this is interesting. And who, who do you share the data with? Okay, well, we currently share the data only with the participants. We, we believe, and I'm old school about this, I've been doing this for 20 years, started working with the uh, Intel Digital Health Group with a guy named Eric Dishman back in the early 2000s. And our idea was, at the time, was to create smart homes that allow people to live with utmost independence. And what we learned very quickly was to live independently, you really need to live interdependently. And we all do, but we don't acknowledge it. Uh, and, and so we wanted to create connection and relationships between people and communities. So the data is shared with a group of peers within your community. That's why we call this peer care. That's great. Yes. Uh, and so our current platform is a minimum viable product 
we're using just three of these types of sensors, okay? And these are use the latest Bluetooth technology. Um, and it, this allows whole house sensing. And what we do is by design, very simple, having done the complex problems first. We tag the meds, we tag something like the refrigerator to indicate that a person is on their eating schedule. And we tag the person. And the reason we tag the person is because many of these smart home uh, alert systems generate lots of false positives. And when the boy cries wolf too often, we know that that's how you kill uh, an alerting system, right? So yeah. we have a, a sensor that detects that the person's home or not. If they're not home, we don't raise an alert. If they're out having dinner with their you know, grandchildren, no, no reason to raise an alert because they haven't eaten their meal. But if they're home, and we know that they're home because the sensors on their keychain or in their pocketbook. Um, yeah, I was going to ask and, where that sensor is. Yeah. Yes. Then, and they're not eating and or not taking their medications. That raises an alert on an app. And the app shows each person at the center of their care wheel. I don't know if I can bring it up on my own phone quick enough here. Um, let's see if it, if it comes up. Okay, we're logging into. Bring it a little closer to the camera. Yeah, the, the focus. There you go. Okay. And it's in the process of logging in. If I took my, you know what it is, it's I have this background filter. But anyway, you can see here I am surrounded by people in my community who've all agreed to share this sensor data. And one of these folks, Bill, who's a, actually a member of my board of directors, has a red alert right now. And mm -hmm. if we were to tap his, uh, his alert, we'd see what was causing the problem. Um, I'm sorry that it's out of focus. I, I could take yeah. me too long to turn this off. But, but basically, it's a very simple visual app. And it's a very simple set of sensors, which we designed specifically to be easy to install uh, by the elder themselves. We basically plug a gateway into a, 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 an AC plug, like a nightlight. You plug a nightlight in. We have stick them that you just stick these devices on the fridge, on the meds, and you're good to go. Um, we learned the hard way th in, through this pandemic. We'd already started deploying these devices, but we were using commercial sensors, commercial mm -hmm. IoT technology, and it's not user-friendly and it's certainly not elder ready. Um, just replacing the batteries in those devices is a task. So um, if you go to, the, um, to, to our uh, poster session, I actually have a little video on how we do it, but I, I can show you the, the, the battery goes into a slot in the side of the sensor. And if I had another battery handy, um, I'm going to use a guitar pick because I don't have a battery here. But when, when it's time to change the battery, this, this guitar pick is my next battery. I just put it into the slot on one end uh, right, and, and the battery out the pops other. out on the other end. And so it's uninterrupted. Okay. Uh -huh. And none of the commercial sensor systems have this kind of simple elder ready sensor system. Uh, they, they're, they're all, you know, they're all designed to, to be, uh, if you have a, for example, a, a, a key fob for your car, if you've ever had to replace the battery on that, you've got to unscrew things, you've got to pry the button yeah, cell off yeah, the right. uh, circuit board, you know, you can't ask elders to do this. So the whole system is designed from the ground up to be elder friendly. Um, and, and it works. We have people during the pandemic who are grateful to be part of this project because they can stay virtually connected. They can respond to each other's needs. Um, if, if there is uh, an issue. And the issue is essentially an anomaly. We detect the absence of um, what we would ex expected behaviors, habitual uh, daily activities. That's what generates the anomaly, the alert, and that's what keeps a group of people connected in their community through the pandemic. And the cool thing about this, um, you know, so much of, of what goes on these days um, in, uh, in apps is monetization. Monetization for the benefit of, let's not even go into it. Uh, yeah, you know, right. the, uh, uh, the, the uh, capital uh, economy. We yeah. monetize people's time every time they use their app, every time they, they check on a person in their group. But that uh, is social capital that goes into a time bank account, which they can then use to purchase other services from people within their community. So it actually enriches elders um, as well as as connects them. So they're 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 
both you know emotionally and financially enriched by participating in the care bank program. So, Claude, you you, you raised a number of questions. One is, um, how do people know about this app, and how big is a network of people using it? And then, as I I think I'm glad you raised the issue of monetization. It's more like how do you sustain yourself financially? I mean, is this a product that's in the market? Great questions. Um, the way we currently uh, find participants is through uh, groups of people who already acknowledge the importance of social connection. Here in the United States, we have something called the Village to Village Network, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, these are elders who recognize the value of uh, being connected to each other in their community. They already have an ethos of neighbors helping neighbors. So this just uh, provides some technological context for them to do that. Um, and cooperatives as well. Uh, yeah. I mean, I like the fact that the connection is not sort of a, uh, not paternalistic, but a uh, the notion of someone overseeing uh, or the, that it's a peer-to-peer -peer relationship and that you're creating a circle and that people are choosing who it is within their circle. Is there also, are there also multi-generational circles? So can people choose to add individuals that are uh, from other or uh, within their family circle or that they know uh, within uh, the, their community? That's a, that's a very good question, very perceptive. In the current version, it's just a group of elder peers who are cohering through this. Which is great, platform. that that creates equity because they're all monitoring each other as opposed and, to... And yes, and that's fundamentally different from systems where the adult child imposes this big brother technology right. upon their elders and flips the whole family dynamic. That was mm -hmm. one of their design purposes. But what we would like to do is to be able to share a particular elder's channel with, uh, let's say, a family caregiver or members of the family who want to see that they're doing okay. But we want to present a different level of information, uh, just the information that they're okay or not okay, rather than the more intimate information about you know, the, the specifics of how they're going about their daily activities. Because this in technology is inherently intrusive. Um, right, yeah. and, and we want to, we want to minimize that feeling of, of intrusion or, 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 la or loss of privacy by making it equitably horizontal peer to peer and and share uh share this kind of information judiciously with the people who are the prime beneficiaries but absolutely we'd like to uh, add people we want to make this intergenerational this has tremendous value for people of all ages living with disabilities mm -hmm. um, right you know, because it's all about independence through interdependence uh um yeah and, and so uh and victor you asked another question about how how we can support this how you know uh what I see is um, when I look at the cost of medication non-adherence, when uh, we're beginning to understand the costs of loneliness, social isolation, and related comorbidities, these are multi-billion dollar costs to our society, to our healthcare system, to uh, CMS in the United States. Um, if we could just share a fraction of those savings, we would be able to build out this care bank platform to serve the country. And ultimately, I like to be able to share it with the world. So this Catalyst Award was a tremendous opportunity to bring this idea out into the world because it's it's very hard for a small nonprofit like Care Wheels um, to, to uh, get the kind of, of uh, attention and traction that we need to, to do what my goal has always been, which is to empower elders to take better care of ourselves by taking good care of each other. And uh, in terms of analyzing the pattern and what what causes it to be read, do you capture a how do you capture the pattern? How do you determine that there is read without false alerts as well? Ah, you know, right now we're using a rules based system. We ask the person what their medication schedule is and we put that into their profile. Um, we look at, uh, you know, normal breakfast, lunch, dinner uh, time windows. Uh, but I've done work in the past with uh, machine learning experts, and what we would ultimately do in a uh, production system would be to uh, have some self-training, have some machine learning based on a person's patterns of how they're actuating the sensors. And after a week or two, um, the, the system would be able to, uh, to, to 
do it predictively. And of course, with, with a machine learning system, it's constantly learning. So if a person's patterns uh, change over time, uh, that would be detected. And some of those changes might be clinically significant. Uh, for example, there's a group here at Oregon Health Science University that's uh, studying how uh, uh, things like medication adherence, uh, loss of medication adherence may be a preclinical marker of cognitive decline. So we could do longitudinal studies over this data set and be able to perhaps predict uh, cognitive decline before a person um, you know, is, is uh, diagnosed by the clinician. So there are a lot of, of advanced applications that one can do once they're generating these kinds of data. But the challenge is getting this into elders' hands in a context that is meaningful to them, being connected to your friends and neighbors, knowing that if something happens, uh, you're not going to be all alone. You're not going to die alone, that, that ultimate indignity of, of the lonely death, that um, if you stop doing your normal behaviors, that's going to be recognized. It's going to be detected, and your neighbors will be on the phone, and if you don't pick up your phone, they'll be at your door. So tell me a little bit more about your work, Judah. Okay, yeah. Well, I had a five to seven um, minute presentation to give. I, I, I think rather than giving that, I'll tell you about it since I think it's largely a conversation between the two of us. Um, yes. yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm the director of something called the Inclusive Design Research Center, which I started back in 93. And our primary vision and mission is to ensure that emerging socio-technical um, systems are inclusive of everyone. So it's, um, and I also started sort of a field of inclusive design, which is now um, adopted by quite a number of companies. And I started a graduate program in inclusive design. So I have a, a team of about, well, a core team of about 30 permanent research staff, but I'm also within a, a university. And um, a lot of what you mentioned is sort of at the, I mean, the, these are many of the issues that we've been looking at. And in fact, it's interesting because we've arrived at, certainly in the data space, um, the, the notion of, of data cooperatives. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, uh, because of the issues of privacy, because of the issues of outliers and small minorities being some uh, being um, biased against, even if we have full representation, even if um, we have uh, bias removed from systems, um, our data systems uh, in terms of uh, predictive analytics and probabilistic machine learning is going to um, be wrong or um, uh, is not going to optimize towards uh, small minorities and outliers. Yes. And that um, creates problems, not just for those individuals, but in general, because then the systems can't uh, deal with the unpredictable, with um, uh, complexity even, or transfer from situation to situation. So you were talking about uh, false positives in terms of an alert system, especially alert systems based upon, um, well, a variety of, uh, it, it, if AI or uh, predictive machine uh, learning is there, then false po positives abound. And it tends to be the individuals who are um, the small minorities and outliers. So even with security systems, um, there's often collateral damage because uh, the the pattern is not uh, contained within um, the the um, the machine learning model learning model. Um, there's a back in 2015, um, I uh, was involved in a study of uh, or testing um, automated vehicles, and I tested them with um, a friend of mine who pushes her wheelchair backwards through intersections. And in every case with all of the machine learning models, they chose to run her over because the predictive analytics said that she was going the other way, even when there was a, a huge amount of data um, regarding uh, people in wheelchairs and intersections, they actually ran her over with greater confidence. So the um, that then started me on this path of, well, what, what's going on here and why, um, even with um, full representation, even with um, 
the you know the no bias within the system caused by the data we we're still um, not able to intelligently address the needs of people who are not uh, um, average typical etc so the um the the other um, engagement I had was uh, with the OPP and others regarding data fraud and data abuse and why was there a uh, so the the seniors fraud unit um, and it, what became quite clear is none of the privacy protections worked if you're highly unique so if you're the only one in the neighborhood um, ordering a colostomy bag um, it it really doesn't matter whether the um, the data is anonymized at source, you are going to be re-identified. And um, if you use differential privacy protections, um, it'll remove all of the data that makes the system work for you. So the privacy protections really don't work. We need um, um, alternative strategies for preventing data abuse and misuse, which led us to looking at um, bottom-up user-owned um, data cooperatives. So I, I, I like the circle that you've created because it's it's among peers, there isn't a hierarchy. It isn't, as you say, a big brother uh, relationship. It's with other individuals that are, uh, that know your situation and that um, serve your, or that are also uh, creating a reciprocal as opposed to, and. Uh, so there, uh, I think it it creates this trusting relationship, which is is wonderful. And you're right. I mean, isolation and loneliness are some of the biggest issues at the moment, health issues, et cetera. So uh, that's great. So were you in the Catalyst um, competition? And have you? Yeah, great. Yes, yes we, we won one of the uh, National Academy of Medicine Catalyst Awards. We use those funds. Um, to continue a pilot and when the uh, commercial IoT technology uh, began to, to fail, we realized we needed to accelerate our next step, which was to develop an elder ready sensor system. Um, and we, I, I searched uh, the internet globally for something that uh, used the new Bluetooth 5 long range protocol and nobody's got a, a commercial sensor system like that. so we developed our own. Fortunately, I, uh, right in my neighborhood here, there's a retired MD, PhD, who uh, did his uh, doctoral work at St in Stanford on, uh, on RF uh, uh, technology, and he was very happy to, uh, to help develop this new Bluetooth 5 sensor. So it is, it's the state of the art of, of uh, Bluetooth technology. Um, that's good news and bad news. It's uh, for right now, most uh, smartphones don't have this long range capability, what they call uh, a coded physical layer. It's a um, forward error correction technology, um, but it's a protocol that will be incorporated in more and more devices. So we're currently using a Bluetooth 5 to cellular uh, gateway, which is just a little box that plugs in on the wall, as I said, which is nice for people who don't have a smartphone. They don't need it to participate. Uh, but that adds substantially to the cost of both the hardware and also the cellular connectivity. But I imagine that in the next year or three, most smartphones will have this capability, which means we can use a smartphone as the gateway um, and reduce the cost of the sensor system to under 50 bucks. And so that really makes something that uh, anybody can participate in. We want to minimize the cost. We want to maximize the connectivity. Uh, that's always been my goal. Um, and I founded CareWheels as a 501c3 because at the time, uh, Intel Research Council uh, was looking for uh, smart home technology projects. Mm -hmm. And I proposed to do a living laboratory uh, and, you know, for technology for smart home technology for elders. And they were very excited about that. And they thought oh, I was absolutely crazy to, to even proposed to do this kind of work with frail elders, I said, well, wait a minute, how about we do it with pre-senescent and people with severe disabilities as proxies for those frail elders? These are people who are already marginalized in our society. Let's actually build a living lab within a uh, barrier-free housing community for people with disabilities who are living independently, give them all this technology, 
let them play with it and do participatory design research. Let them tell us what works. And we thought they were going to tell us, you know, voice activation works better than buttons and so forth and so on. But what they really told us was sharing our data within the building, within our group, is mm -hmm. what helps us because we already know we need each other in order to survive. And by sharing this data, we can do that better. That was the aha that led right, to the yeah. Fairbank project. They taught me what what works. Um, right. And yeah. So well, that's great. Yeah. I mean, we we are uh, great believers in co-design, participatory design, um, and the individuals that are going to be most impacted by this are lead in in both the problem statement and in designing um, the the approach that. I really like that. So, how uh, are have you implemented it um, anywhere yet, or is this still in prototype stage? We've done three pilots. The first pilot was with healthy friendlies, um, starting with members of my board of directors, my fellow engineers <laughs> on the project. And, you know, you've you've got to you know shake out the bugs in in a in a new system. And once we were confident that it was working well, I went to the local uh, senior center and recruited a cohort from that group. And um, then one of the people at the senior center belongs to a, what we call a NORC, a naturally occurring retirement community. And so this gave us an opportunity to work with older elders, uh, our eldest being 95 years old. Uh, and they already were cohering as a, as a you know, NORC community. And so they invited Care Wheels in to um, instrument their homes and put the uh, app on their uh, on all their devices i mean we support ios android and uh, since it's a web-based app you can do it on a laptop or a pc too so um and and um that's that's when COVID hit and we recognize the other value of this kind of of virtual connectivity when you have to socially isolate for your own health and well-being uh your well-being really depends upon some form of, of connectivity, and this provides 24-7 connectivity. It's not verbal, it's not facial, but people who use this technology for a while tell us that it, it's kind of like a conversation. You know, you look at your app, you see that people are, you know, going about their business. One, one woman uh, said, you know, I always used to call my, my neighbors too early, and now I wait to see that the fridge is open and they've had their first cup of coffee before I call them and, and wake them up. Um, so it, it is a nonverbal conversation that people begin to have through this technology. And what it does is it, it, um, it gives people a feeling of connection. It gives, gives them a sense of, of purpose. Uh, that they, you know, they need to get up in the morning and check to see how the members of their group are doing. Um, and they know that that other people will uh, respond to their needs. So it's it's the closest I could come to a very simple yet holistic system that synergizes, uh, you know, a more conventional uh, telehealth technology and you know, remote monitoring technology with uh, the, the time bank and uses behavioral um uh, economic principles to reward people for doing, you know, for doing this good work. Yeah, that's great. Um, there's a, um, I mean, it, what it brings to mind is a, um, here, I, I'll put in the chat, um, we put together a, a video with Microsoft that, and you'll, you'll appreciate the beginning of it, which is um, a woman who, uh, was used to be a seam uh, was a tailor or a seamstress, and she had a, a, a circle of friends who all were, and the um, yeah. Well, I'll let you watch it. I, I Thank think you. we have to, um, but they're, they're using IoT to to keep that circle um, together and to give that sense of continued community. Um, yes, I, I look forward to that. Have you visited um, our our poster on? Uh, on the uh, poster hall? No, unfortunately, this is uh, today's my first uh, um, opportunity to actually look at this uh, whole conference because okay. I've been, it's the first day of classes and um, I, I also overcommitted in terms of the presentations I'm giving this week. If you click on this link when you're back in the uh, session, you'll see the poster, you'll see a little video of myself and my colleague, Mark, talking about the development of the system um, and its advantages. 
And uh, if, if uh, you're interested, I'd love to continue a conversation. I'm always looking for creative collaborators because um, there's, there's so much to be done to get this out into the world. Uh, if I have one regret, it's that uh, I've been working in this field of gerund technology for two decades and I wasn't ready for the pandemic. I, I didn't have, the system wasn't out in the world where it could have really uh, had some positive impact on uh, both the, you know, the environmental and social determinants of health prior to the pandemic. So uh, I call this a social care network for the pandemic and aftermath. Yes, right. And um, I, we have an international partnership, um, including with, well, qu quite actively with Finland and Norway and a variety of other um, countries, Spain, um, Ireland, and uh, there we have uh, something called the Shared Wisdom Project, which I, I think it would, this uh, sounds like something that it would be great to share with, with our Shared Wisdom Project. Um, the Shared Wisdom Project is, um, well, uh, I'll, I'll, I can send you or, um, well, the, the best way to get to it probably is our, um, Yeah, um, this, uh, our, uh, the center site. Okay, thank you for that. And let me give you my email address if, uh, if you'd like to continue our right. conversation. As I said, I'm, I'm always looking for people. And it sounds like we have really complementary background yeah. experience. Okay. Um, it sounds like your projects have tremendous depth. Um, and, and I've divin divin is that past tense of dived i've dived deep before and come back to the surface and said well wait a minute um there's a whole lot that can be done the question is what should be done and what will actually be adopted by our fellow elders and what are they going to be able to afford yeah. um you know um so uh, i i'm very interested in in uh, exploring collaborations with you and thank you for a, a great conversation i'm, I'm so you. glad i clicked on this link and found this little intimate group to be able to, to share with. Them. Right, yeah. And I understand from Radhika that um, we need to close now, is that right? That is correct. Thank you both for your time. Uh, it was a wonderful to be a little fly on the wall during this. <laughs> Thank you, Radhika. And I will, I'll, I'll email you <laughs> so Thank that you so we can much. stay connected. Great. It's a pleasure. Enjoy yeah. the rest of the conference the summit. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you both.